Greetings, fellow church nerds. Today in our crash course on the basics of discipleship that we've been going through this fall, we are talking about education. And there is much to talk about when it comes to being Presbyterian and education. Exhibit A. Within the United States, the PCUSA, that's us, is in the top five church denominations that have the most educated congregations. 47% of our denomination has at least a college degree, whereas the population of the adults in the United States in general with a college degree is only at 27%. I zoomed in because I know it's so small. So we're where the little red arrow is, and the very bottom line there is like the general population of the United States. If we look at the education that we require for our clergy, we are the only mainline church, including the Roman Catholic Church, they don't do this, that requires clergy to learn both Greek and Hebrew, the original languages of the Bible. You have to learn both of them to be ordained. Presbyterians operate 10 or 12, depending on how you count, seminaries across the United States and Puerto Rico. We have an entire certification process for Christian educators. Within the history of the Reformed Church, in John Calvin's initial plan for the church government, there were four jobs to which one could be ordained, pastors, elders, deacons, and teachers. (laughs) We still ordain people to teaching positions. It is considered a calling. Within our denomination, there are endless continuing education opportunities provided for every type of church employee and congregation member. There's music and finance and anti-racism work and everything in between. We have PCUSA conference centers. We have PCUSA colleges. There's a publishing company editorial magazines, curriculums, scholarships, mission organizations focused on expanding access to education, you name it, we've got it. On a personal level, my guess is that if you have been coming to church for a good chunk of your life, you might remember as a kid your Sunday school experience more than you remember worship. Am I right? Or maybe you remember those midweek classes or a vacation Bible school. When I ask people about what church has been like for them, those are the things that I hear about first. And how many of you nowadays, you don't have to raise your hand, love a good historical or theological-based Bible study? Or how about an in-depth presentation on something like the early reformers or the minor prophets or how missionaries do their work abroad? You're laughing, but I know you like them. Maybe you're more the speed of a book group that also has coffee cake. Friends, just the fact that we have Bibles in our pews in front of each person and that we make sure the children of our church have their own Bible, it shows that we care about education. Here is scripture. It's accessible for everyone and it's there for you, not just up here on the communion table, but for everyone. Not every church does this. This very sermon series is based on the importance of educating ourselves about the basics of discipleship. Having sermons in general means that we value the growth and the study of scripture. Again, not every church has sermons. If I haven't made my case yet for being uh, education church nerds, (laughs) the PCUSA website says this. Education is one of the hallmarks of the Reformed tradition, from Calvin's Geneva to John Knox's dictum for all of Scotland, a school in every parish, to America and all parts of the world. Education has been 
and continues to be a central feature of Presbyterian and Reformed ministry. We are church nerds, and truly, nothing makes me happier. All you have to do is go look at the massive amount of books in my office, or the ones that are also stacked on my nightstand, or the ones also listed on my Amazon wish list, to confirm this. And I looked for it this morning, but I used to have notebooks, and I think I used them all, and the front of the notebook said Presby Geek, and they were like my favorite thing that I had. But, and if you know my sermons by now, I know that you knew there was a but coming. When it comes to education and our faith, there's a distinction that we need to make. We aren't looking to be educated and to educate others just for the sake of being smarter than some other church or so we can say that we have all these Presbyterian colleges and publishing companies and whatnot. And we're not talking about education as a part of our faith because we think it'll like get us into heaven faster or because education alone makes us the best Christians of them all. We are church nerds who love and encourage education because it draws us closer to God and it deepens our faith. A faith that uses education to make room for questions and exploration and study alongside mission and service and worship that we offer, that is a growing and blossoming faith. Today, I had a hard time picking what scripture to read because there are so many Bible verses that talk about wisdom and learning in the Bible, but I kept coming back to the story of Nicodemus that Pastor Matt read for us because this story is full of faith education. Remember, Nicodemus is a Pharisee, which means he is highly educated. (laughs) He could read, he could write, he would have studied the Hebrew scriptures and the law. Being a Pharisee is a big deal. But despite all of his formal education, of which would have been about his faith, when Nicodemus hears Jesus speaking and sees what Jesus is doing, he develops some questions. Now he has these questions and note that Nicodemus does not say, I don't understand, oh well, I'm just gonna walk away and assume that that guy was wrong. Nor does he assume that he, a Pharisee, knows better than Jesus. No, no, I've studied it all and what you're saying is not right. And also, Nicodemus doesn't hear what Jesus say and then just blindly follow his teachings without thinking about them first. Nicodemus decides to use education to make his faith deeper. When he meets Jesus, he wants to know more. He's curious and he has questions to study. When Nicodemus approaches Jesus, he calls him rabbi, which means teacher. Time out. Please hear me clearly when I say that when you meet Jesus, when you hear what Jesus is saying, when you see what Jesus is doing and you think about it and you have questions, that is good. That is good and wise to be curious. We love education, church nerds, remember? Back to Nicodemus. He wants to ask Jesus about his questions, but he's still a Pharisee, and even though it's only in chapter three of the Gospel of John, still kind of early on in Jesus' ministry, it's already not good for a Pharisee to be seen with Jesus. So Nicodemus comes to Jesus under the cover of night. Here at the beginning of Nicodemus's story, his faith is shy. I'm sure he was anxious and worried and probably confused. And even so, Jesus welcomes him. 
Jesus and Nicodemus have a full-on theological conversation about birth and rebirth and spirit and the kingdom of God in the middle of the night. They go back and forth in a way that does not happen too often in scripture. Most of the time, Jesus' interactions in the gospels are very short. Someone says one thing or asks one question and then Jesus responds, but that's the extent of the conversation. Here, Nicodemus is asking follow-up questions. What about this? What did you mean by that? This is like a late-night one-on-one study session where Jesus is the tutor and Nicodemus is the panicked student trying to learn more. Nicodemus begins his relationship with Jesus and his faith journey by asking questions of Jesus and learning alongside him so that he can deepen his faith. This is the type of education that is part of our discipleship. This is the education we mean when we talk about faith education. When kids go to Sunday school or grown-ups go to adult ed, it's not just to memorize books of the Bible. It's to learn alongside Jesus and to deepen your faith. That's why we tell you to keep coming. Now, we can't cut out the ending of this scripture. Nicodemus also reminds us that our education sometimes just leads to more questions. Learning more does not always provide a happy ending with an A plus on your test, much to my personal dismay. In verse nine, Nicodemus pleads, how can these things be? And Jesus answers by reiterating that not all highly educated people know everything that there is to know about faith and God. Jesus says, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Ouch. Aren't you supposed to know this, Nicodemus? Now, I don't think that Jesus is being mean here. He's not pointing out things that are impossible for Nicodemus to know, especially at the start of his faith journey, and then like taunting him with it. But rather, Jesus is pointing out to Nicodemus that the life that he thought he knew so well, the rules and the law and the minutia that the Pharisees treasured and then held over the heads of the people, that all of that is not the most important part of a good and healthy faith. And that now, Jesus is the one to help point him in the right direction that Jesus is the ultimate teacher, and that Jesus will help us learn how to have a healthy faith that draws us near to God. Imagine Jesus saying the phrase more like this. Aren't you a teacher? Haven't you learned so much, but here you are, recognizing that maybe there are some things that don't make sense? Or that maybe somewhere along the line, you got your priorities wrong? I'm here to help. It's only a couple verses later that Jesus says, for God so loved the world that God sent his only son. Here I am, Nicodemus. I'm here to help you learn and grow and deepen your faith. And Nicodemus does. We don't know exactly what happens to him over the next 16 chapters in the gospel, which span a couple years of Jesus' ministry. But at the end of the gospel, in chapter 19, we read this. After the death of Jesus, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. 
They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices and linen cloths according to the burial customs of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, laid Jesus there. Nicodemus, who came at night because he was afraid to be seen with Jesus, who then asked questions, who then learned about his faith with Jesus, and then, just like we hope for in our education and our faith, eventually Nicodemus grew closer to God, so much so that when Jesus died at the hands of Nicodemus' fellow Pharisees and when all of the disciples had abandoned Jesus, Nicodemus Demas stepped forward out of the night and into the day. When we learn in our faith, when we grow, even if it's a bumpy road, we get closer to God. And that allows us to do the hardest and the most important of things. Sunday school and adult ed and Advent devotionals and Bible studies and retreat centers and colleges and publishing companies and biblical Hebrew are not just so that we can be fellow church nerds together. But we learn, we ask questions, we educate ourselves our whole lives. And we share what we have learned with others. We recite what we know to our children and we talk about it when we are at home and when we are away and when we lie down and when we rise, like it says in Deuteronomy that Cindy read. We do all of this to draw closer to God and deepen our relationship with Jesus, to take our faith from the night to the glory of the daytime. This faith bolstered by education is what will carry us through the hardest of times. Education has been and continues to be a central feature of Presbyterian and Reformed ministry. So let's get learning. Amen.